Hello everyone and welcome to the Fire Safety Vocation Method webinar for architects and building designers. We appreciate you all logging in and attending this session. Um, my name is Alexander Armstrong. I'm here on behalf of the Australian Building Codes Board. Um, and let me just, I'm just here for some introduction and I will run you through the workings of today. So we have myself um, running today's seminar. We have Paul England, who is uh, representing the Australian Building Codes Board from a fire engineering perspective, and he's providing us an introduction to the fire safety verification method. And we also have Mark Wybro from the uh, AFAC, who is looking at providing um, a fire authority's perspective on the fire safety verification method. Um, following that, we will have some question and answers. We would appreciate if you could log your questions throughout the presentation so that we have a chance to have a look through them um, and find common trends and answer any, any of those common questions that are coming through. And we will get through as many as we can. Uh, today's um, presentation, we're looking at achieving a few learning outcomes for yourself. Firstly, it's gaining a better under technical understanding of the fire safety verification method for architects and building designers and how that will impact your um, job, your day-to-day -day job. Um, also to just gain a better understanding of how architects and building designers can be involved in the fire safety verification method process. Uh, and finally, as always, looking to increase everyone's confidence in working on projects using the fire safety verification method when it becomes, when it transitions into becoming a, a valid method within the code on 1 May. Um, now I'll pass to Paul England, who will be looking at running an introduction to the verification method. Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, just give you a, a brief overview and then run into a little bit more detail on, on a, a few of the uh, critical areas. Um, first thing to note is that the fire safety verification method is provided in Schedule 7 of the NCC 2019 um, and it's due to become active on the 1st of May this year. Um, it provides a process for verifying compliance of fire safety performance solutions with the NCC. Uh, it's worth noting that other options can still be used, but the um, fire safety verification method does provide a robust uh, method with, with a benchmark being uh, uh, a deemed to satisfy building. Okay. Um, so what is the purpose of the fire safety verification method? Well, essentially it's to ensure the minimum level of safety required by the NCC is met using the concept equivalence. And to do this, a, a similar or reference building is defined that complies fully with the DTS provisions. Uh, and then the, the level of safety for that building is checked against the proposed building solution. And if the a uh, proposed building solution is equivalent or safer, then uh, you've complied with the NCC uh, uh, performance provisions. Uh, it is a practical approach pending full quantification of the performance requirements. Currently, the performance requirements are, are specified in qualitative terms, which is a challenge to convert that into acceptance criteria. So uh, the fire safety ver verification method helps that process. It's not a new uh, system or a new approach, and the NCC currently uh, does permit the equivalence uh, concept to be used to demonstrate compliance. Um, if you go back to the early 90s, um, the risk assessment and comparative approaches uh, were used by uh, Vaughan Beck of uh, VUT to evaluate and compare requirements for developing new uh, deemed to satisfy solutions for the NCC and some of you may be uh, aware of CESA risk which came out of that, that work. Um, early in the 2000 and uh, early 2000s uh, a code of practice was prepared by the Society of Fire Safety relating to fire safety design certification and peer review and that uh, was uh, also highlighting the use of a, a comparative approach. Um, more recently, 2005, the IFAG also incorporates um, uh, the equivalence approach and the equivalence approach has been used for some landmark buildings such as the 140 Williams Street project, which some of you may well know uh, uh, quite well. 
Um, that uh, uh, was undertaken in Melbourne and revolve, involved some major reductions in fire resistance levels as well as other, other variations and uh, some mitigation methods, uh, measures that were added. Um, so that was a very landmark project dating from late 90s to early 2000s. Um, there have been a number of questions asked uh, about uh, whether the DTS provisions are an appropriate uh, uh, benchmark. Um, it should be borne in mind that the deemed to satisfy provisions have been rigorous, uh, have a regu rigorously tested rationale that has been through public comment and uh, uh, also scrutiny by uh, all the states, territories, uh, fire authorities and various others through the BCC process. Um, the BCC, which is now, uh, uh, the BCA, which is now the NCC, was originally derived from state and territory regulations. And these were reviewed and consolidated into the first BCA in uh, uh, 1988, but the first uh, broadly adopted version of that was the 1990 version. Um, detailed review of uh, the 90 version was undertaken by the Fire Code Reform Centre. Uh, uh, leading to uh, uh, a revised uh, uh, document which included a performance-based approach, and that was the BCA 96. Uh, the NCC is regularly updated based on detailed analysis and goes through a public comment process, uh, and uh, it's open to suggestions, so uh, uh, it's reviewed on a three-yearly cycle. And if you do have any suggestions for improvement, they should be submitted to the uh, a ABCB. Um, there are a number of uh, supporting resources that have been published to help with the um, uh, use of the uh, fire safety verification method. Um, these include a, um, a handbook, and that provides uh, detailed guidance on applying the fire safety verification method. Uh, the information is to assist all stakeholders, not just fire, fire safety engineers, that are involved in the performance-based design brief process. Uh, and it identifies other real relevant technical documents such as IFEG, uh, International Fire Engineering Guidelines, and national and international standards where, where appropriate. Uh, that's essentially a, um, a procedural uh, a document. It takes you through the big picture stuff. And there are additional information uh, provided, which are provided in data sheets, which accompany the handbook. The um, da data sheets are written in a form um, that uh, can be regularly uh, updated. So it's particularly easy to update. The handbook can also be updated if there's a need, but the data sheets are, are individually dated and have a, 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 a revision uh, tables in them. Uh, they provide data and details of analysis and methods that would be useful uh, where more relevant information isn't available. Um, they can be progressively updated, as I've said before, as more relevant uh, information becomes available. And they cover such things as uh, development of design fires. Uh, there's a lot on uh, effectiveness, which is the reliability and performance of fire safety systems that are commonly looked at in performance solutions and also address uh, issues such as occupant response and evacuation. Um, you, uh, architects should really be aware and uh, uh, building designers of these documents. Some of them are a little bit technical, but others are, are more general. Okay, I'll now run through some of the uh, highlights of the fire set, uh, safety verification method that makes it uh, a little bit different from uh, routine uh, equivalence approaches. So uh, the first thing is that uh, um, there is guidance that's provided in the handbook on the selection of uh, reference buildings. Uh, and this is really to limit what I've called DTS wrangling when defining the reference building. Uh, one of the most important aspects of the verification methods is making sure that a, an appropriate reference building uh, uh, has been defined. And some of the principles that should be applied 
in the selection process. There are more in the handbook, but I'll just run through some of the main ones. Uh, the reference building should fully comply with the NCC DTS provisions, including relevant state or territory variations. So if you're building in a particular state, you make sure that reference building complies with the relevant state variations. It should have the same footprint, floor area, and volume as, as the proposal. Um, th this has caused uh, a fair bit of angst, but uh, uh, that there are comments that the um, verification method and equivalence approach is really limited by the uh, determination of an appropriate reference building. And by requiring a similar footprint, floor area, and volume, uh, it takes out a number of the uh, issues that could be, shall we say, manipulated to, to give an outcome. And depending on the perspective of the various participants in the performance-based uh, uh, design brief, there could be lengthy uh, discussions, in which I'm called wrangling to be polite, about whether it's uh, positive or, or negative and whether it makes a, a fair uh, comparison. So these principles are clearly defined to try and limit that, that flexibility. Uh, similarly, you should have the same occupant numbers and characteristics as the proposal. This is an interesting one because uh, if, if you start playing around with uh, occupant numbers, um, it, it has a massive impact on uh, societal risk, which I'll talk uh, briefly about a little bit later. Uh, and, and therefore makes comparison, it can give some quite uh, unusual results, which are, are, are valid, but uh, um, uh, it's easier to keep the same uh, occupant number, shall we say. Um, you should have the same fire brigade response and arrival time. Obviously the building is gonna be in the same location. And unless you're playing around with alarm times, the fire brigade would be expected to show up at the same time. Uh, where there are options uh, for fire protection measures adopted in combination uh, or a combination of, of measures based on sound engineering principles should be adopted. Uh, th this occurs, there are a number of places, even though it's deemed to satisfy in the NCC provisions that give you a large number of uh, options as to what you may wish to use, especially with, in relation to smoke hazard management. It's therefore uh, important that the uh, whole of the performance-based design brief team are satisfied that a reasonable approach based on sound fire engineering principles has been adopted to define an acceptable level of safety. Um, and finally, last one I'll run through is if appropriate, include additional features that may not be addressed uh, or fully addressed through adoption of the current NCC DTS provisions. A couple of examples are, are here. Uh, the DDA uh, requires uh, provision uh, to be allowed for evacuation of people with disabilities. Uh, the NCC acknowledges it, but doesn't really provide uh, clear deem to satisfy advice. So obviously you're going to make provision for the uh, uh, evacuation of, of people with disabilities in both the reference building and the design uh, uh, building. Also, if you choose to use lifts for evacuation, um, that, that is something that you may also consider for the reference building, depending on the context. Okay, moving on. Um, uh, there's also, and this is a, a big strength of the um, verification method, it defines a minimum range of scenarios to be considered to reduce uh, the risk of critical scenarios being overlooked. This doesn't preclude the addition of other verification methods where it's considered that they may well be more critical, but you have to consider these. Uh, and it, the word consider doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do uh, a massive detailed analysis. Some of these, the outcomes with these scenarios would be self-evident from a, a preliminary review, but that review needs to be documented and, and clearly articulated. Um, looking at some of these uh, scenarios, there are some that maybe commonly haven't been used in the past uh, for some performance solutions. Things like uh, uh, the first one, which is uh, blocked uh, exits, where a fire blocks an evacuation uh, route. This is obviously very critical, especially when there's a single evacuation route or things like that. So uh, it really makes you think about 
the layout of the building uh, and, and is quite important. Um, another one of interest is fire starts in concealed spaces. Um, again, not always looked at in the past, but a fire breaking out of a concealed space that may not have a, a detection or alarm system or the, the operation of that may be uh, uh, deferred, again, can have uh, a significant impact. Uh, fire brigade intervention, and that's more, uh, uh, I'll leave that for the fire brigade to talk about, but that's uh, uh, very critical and should uh, be considered both from a uh, perspective of firefighting, but also evacuation and the safety of firefighters. Uh, common one from previous uh, 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 approaches is a worst credible scenario. Uh, that is, is generally um, um, reasonably well understood. Uh, but there's also a robustness check, which looks at the reliability of systems and looking at failure of systems. So these are very important because not all fire safety systems have the same reliability. So they could perform uh, and have the same uh, uh, efficacy, i.e. They, they achieve the safety if they actually operate in accordance with their design perspectives. But some systems might have a reliability of, of um, 50%, where others may be closer to 90%. So you've got to make sure you're comparing like with like with respect to reliability as, as, as well. Uh, things like structural stability and other property protection are also considered. So it's an interesting list, but it's not exclusive, so you can always add to it. Okay, there are also some procedural requirements that are uh, addressed in detail in the handbook. Um, a performance-based design brief process is mandatory. So it, it's not an option, it has to be done. Uh, some participants are mandated, so a client or client's representative, uh, and that may well be the architect or designer in some cases if, if they've been uh, uh, asked to act on behalf of the client. The architect or designer, you're pleased to be note, should, must be involved. Uh, various specialist consultants uh, are generally derived from a stakeholder analysis, and it depends what the issues are, complexity of the building. So that's one that could be varied, but is looked at. Fire Brigade emergency services are, are definitely mandated, and uh, uh, I'll let them talk to that later, but they have to be part of it. And obviously the appropriate authority uh, subject to state legislation, uh, which, could be, uh, which would be a building surveyor or certifier serving a statutory role. Um, that that and, and the degree of involvement will vary from state to state. Um, the performance-based design brief team uh, involved in, is, is involved in defining the reference building, as I've said before, and that's uh, a very critical part of the process. Uh, the fire safety verification method does adopt an holistic approach, and this has been identified by current Warren Centre and others as being quite critical. So that means that you uh, consider all the uh, uh, performance solutions interacting together as one performance solution or one performance uh, 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 design building, and that's compared to the reference building. So it's a holistic analysis of the interaction of all those variations. Um, tenability criteria are, are specified in the fire safety verification method if you are using ASET v RSET type analysis, although the sensitivity to those things is, is is not as great as uh, it could be in an absolute analysis because you're using a comparative analysis. And as I alluded to earlier, individual and societal risks should be considered. Individual risk really means uh, looking at the risk of it to an individual, whereas society, uh, societal risk means looking at, at in simple terms, uh, the risk of multiple fatalities from a, 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 a single incident. Okay, we'll move on now. Okay, so now I'll just go through a little bit on the application of the fire safety verification method. Um, so looking at the design process, and obviously this is very close to uh, your hearts as effectively being the chief designers of these buildings. Um, the stakeholder input is, in, is critical to that. And uh, there are two boxes shown here. One is uh, the NCC, what are called drivers and constraints, which are uh, 
things like safety, health, amenity, accessibility, sustainability, and protection of other property to the degree necessary. Um, but there are additional drivers and constraints, as, as you'll be well aware, in relation to the design of a building. So you've got things like the usability of the building, aesthetics, costs, speed of construction, building flexibility, operational continuity, corporate image of the building owner, environmental protection, uh, heritage protection, uh, workplace health and safety, any other legislation that's relevant. And you may well have enhanced NCC drivers driven by uh, wishes from a client, uh, uh, for example. So the role of a designer is to consider all these and the architect's building designer has a critical task of identifying all these drivers and constraints that may impact on fire safety uh, uh, in addition to just the, the NCC provisions. So the NCC requirements are minimum required levels uh, for career and based on critical societal drivers. Uh, when you've looked at that overall design process, you come up with a proposed building design and the bit we're focusing, focusing on is the NCC compliance determination, but you will also have to determine whether you've complied with the other uh, additional drivers and constraints. That lies outside the scope of this uh, presentation. So moving on. Um, selection of assessment method. Um, this is a key role for the uh, performance design brief group. And the first part of this process is to check NCC compliance. Uh, and the first question you have to ask is, does the design satisfy all DTS requirements? If it satisfies those DTS requirements, then there's no need for any further uh, 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 performance uh, solution development or analysis. Uh, however, if those DTS solutions aren't, aren't satisfied, then you, you have to go the performance solution uh, path. And the next question is, uh, is the fire safety verification method applicable? If it is, uh, then a decision is made to progress down that path. Uh, if not, then you look at other permitted NCC assessment methods. So moving on now to assuming the decisions be made to follow the fire safety verification method. And uh, we then get heavily involved in the performance based design brief uh, uh, process. Core stack, stakeholders, they're listed here. Fire safety engineers obviously got to be involved. Building certi certi uh, surveyor certifier, and that's the statutory certifier. Emergency services, uh, fire brigade, client owner or delegate. In some instances that might be, those uh, requirements may be delegated to the architect and our, our designer, and then occupant, our architect and building designer. So those are the core members of the performance-based uh, design brief team. But there are other members depending on what you're looking at as part of your process. So you could have fire safety practitioners such as emergency management consultants uh, looking at uh, evacuation issues, uh, active, active and passive fire protection uh, company systems. You may be looking at a performance solution that involves them. Uh, active and passive fire protect uh, and and also the designers or installers of those details you might wish, wish to specify a high level of performance out of say a sprinkler system you need somebody to tell you whether that's practical and achievable on, on your project various specialist consultants structural engineers services engineers acoustic access consultants consulting building surveyors the the main person with all the access to these people is the architect and building designer so they need to be identifying along with a fire safety engineer who should be involved. Uh, material suppliers, these may not be fire safety practitioners, but uh, with issues such as combustibility uh, to be considered, uh, they may need to be involved. A peer reviewer, if it's a complex uh, uh, fire safety design, uh, could be required. You may have tenants representative, building operations reps for looking at the implementation stage, builder insurers. All those should be considered for potential membership. And the issues that will be addressed during that brief are description of proposed building solution and the implementation plan, uh, 
So that implementation plan is again critical. The building has to be buildable and built at the end of the day and comply. Uh, define the reference building, uh, and then you identify variations between the reference building and the DTS provisions. Identify relevant performance requirements. All this is currently required by the NCC, but the process is better defined in the fire safety verification method. Identify relevant scenarios as a helping hand there, and then identify analysis methods, inputs, and criteria. The uh, FSVM uh, is quite open about uh, analysis methods, so it's not prescriptive, not overly prescriptive, uh, but the, the use of those methods should be justified. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Um, so the architect building design as well, just a, a highlight. Uh, architect building designer appointed at the start of a project, so you're there from the start, so you should be uh, fully involved in the performance-based design brief right from the very start and be driving it. You may be the only person with a broad coverage of all the drivers and constraints that need to be communicated to the design team, and that includes the fire safety engineer. Uh, you may also be delegated by the client owner to act on their behalf. So you need to have a broad understanding of the NCC along with other drivers and constraints that, uh, but you may need to be supported by a consultant building surveyor. So where the, the uh, uh, statutory building surveyor's role is limited to just a, a yes or no regarding certain things with compliance with being to satisfy. If you want a consultant building surveyor that's going to get involved in the design process, uh, they could be involved in the design team but they do need to be independent of the statutory uh, building surveyor in most states. So the architect or, or building designer will tend to coordinate consultants if no project managers are involved. Uh, and in your important role is to continually check all drivers and constraints have been satisfied and that the fire safety engineer is made aware of any potential changes in, uh, even outside the fire safety area that could impact on, on the fire safety engineering design. And uh, uh, finally, you go through a review of the analysis and sign off. So the building surveyor, peer reviewer and fire brigades will be particularly interested, but you need to review the final design documentation, implementation and maintenance plans to, discern, to again determine independently if other, all the drivers have been satisfied. You want to review the documentation to check if there is adequate information to facilitate compliance at the end of the construction project, uh, project and through the building life and also look at the responsibilities for design and implementation. Who is going to be responsible for that? As, as the lead designer, you have some exposure in this area. So if you haven't allocated somebody to fulfill the role of overseeing the design, noting that a building surveyor does have some responsibilities, but that's generally an audit process. So you really need to, to consider that. Uh, and potentially a, a good way of doing that is to consider the extension of the performance-based design brief uh, post the design verification. That's where the fire safety verification method ends unless there's any further design changes, but the implementation is critical. So mo moving on to just the last slide, and as I've indicated, this really isn't relevant uh, or, or specific to the fire safety verification method, but the reliability of the system should have been considered and therefore um, this process needs to have been considered to some degree. Uh, and if you look at this diagram, it is complicated. Uh, if you look at the orange areas, you've got things where product supply chains come in. You might need product designers involved in, uh, in the uh, performance-based design brief, but they're definitely going to be involved in the installation. And you've got to look at how any specific design details that are relevant to the uh, performance-based solution are, are, are communicated to those people. Obviously, the builder has a coordination role, but so does the, the architect and building designer. And moving through the construction process, you've also got uh, uh, building use and oc occupation. There's no point in making assumptions about uh, how uh, occupants are going to behave and what cues they're going to be given if the system isn't established to uh, provide that. And you have to maintain your, your, your inspection and, and uh, 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 maintenance uh, procedures uh, throughout the life of the building. So again, that comes into the handover from the architect. So you're, you have an involvement 
extending the role of the performance-based design brief team may help you in this and delegating certain tasks. So that's a, a brief summary of the verification method and just a little bit more on the end. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Now we'll pass across to Mark Wabra from AFAC to provide a, a fire authority perspective on the perspective, sorry, on the fire safety verification method. Thank you, Alex, and thank you to the Australian Building Codes Board for allowing me the opportunity to um, be involved in these webinars. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Assistant Commissioner Community Safety for Fire and Rescue New South Wales, but also the Chair of the AFAC Building Environment Technical Group. So obviously a key stakeholder in the FSVM. Um, as we've heard from Paul, uh, the National Construction Code will now have a requirement that the solution provided by the FSVM must now be compared to the same type of building with DTS provisions. Um, that's an important point and an attractive point for fire services who like certainty in design. Um, the, the FSBM must be equal to or safer than the DTS result. And we do appreciate, fire services appreciate that this, will we, this will require additional work uh, and reviewing, but it will also enable a more informed, holistic safety comparison and therefore uh, expected to be a better result in terms of safety for both the occupants uh, and fire services. And that's an important point because fire services, our responding firefighters, have this building as our place of work once an emergency occurs. So uh, any design using the verification method uh, will still have to go through the same approvals process um, that's in place within each state and territory. Um, that exists for performance solutions in New South Wales, my jurisdiction. Uh, any performance solution comes through us uh, courtesy of the EPNA legislation. It's not an automatic acceptance and it does not have the same acceptance as, say, Codemark, for example. It is a requirement of the FSVM to use all relevant sections um, of the, the verification method and that if any stakeholder has a contrary view, or does not approve of the design or process, et cetera, then this must be documented and attached to the proposal when submitted for approval. That means that any, uh, there's a declaration that um, there's been a disagreement or a difference of opinion over certain provisions. Um, as well as that, in terms of um, uh, the process under which we operate, AFAC welcomes the review by ABCB of IFEC, the International Fire Engineering Guideline and we'll be collaborating closely with the ABC in that review. Um, Paul touched on the fire brigade intervention model, and now AFAC is currently reviewing uh, the FB, uh, FBIM, fire brigade intervention model, and this is scheduled to be ready for uh, release of the FSVM and its implementation from the 1st of May. Um, the fire, service, uh, fire safety verification methodology is supported by all AFAC agencies. Um, there was certainly some internal debate um, and there were comments about things in relation to such things as data. But AFAC believes that with goodwill, good faith by all parties, any varying opinions can be sorted out in the fire engineering brief process uh, that we'll be going through with you. Um, the fire services are a key stakeholder in this process and are expecting to be involved as per the NCC provisions. The extent of the fire services involvement, however, will be, uh, will be decided or determined once the proposal is reviewed. Fire services do understand that the use of the, the VM is not mandatory and that there are other paths um, and methodologies and approaches to show compliance with the NCC, uh, particularly around the performance provision. Regardless of the methodology used though, fire services are expecting to be involved as a stakeholder. Um, currently, the fire services around Australia and New Zealand are reviewing their approach to regulation and their regulatory role. You know, what is the future of fire services? Um, and that's, in some respects, comes out of the Shergold Weir report, the Building Confidence Report, commissioned by the Building Ministers Forum. Um, and that starts to look at what our role should be. And certainly there's been criticism in the past of fire services, um, their performance, their timeliness, their cost. Um, 
And what we're looking for is definitely national consistency. And we see the VM as one approach to ensuring better consistency in fire services input into making buildings safer. However, due to the different regulatory regimes that we work under in each state and territory, um, there will understandably be some differences, some variances. Um, it's important to note that um, it's expected that the, the, the VM will require a degree of competency. Uh, um, and the Warren Centre project, which some of you may be aware of, uh, professionalising fire safety engineering, has certainly um, highlighted the fact that not only the industry has to raise the bar on its performance, but fire services do as well. And uh, we're a key stakeholder, a key contributor to the, um, the Warren Centre's project. Um, one last point, and, and it, it was one of the selling points to have AFAC's approval or endorsement of the, the FSBM when it was proposed, um, is around the fact that uh, there has been limited acknowledgement of firefighters as occupants of the building. Uh, but the VM actually introduces that in terms of the scenarios against which we're going to test the performance of the building. And that includes the unexpected catastrophic failure. Certainly, we don't want firefighters entering a building that then falls down. on. So um, thank you again for um, allowing me to be involved, and I'll hand back to Alex. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we'll now move into the question portion of today's webinar. Um, please feel free to continue to send through any questions if you have them based on today's content. Uh, but first off, I will direct a question to Paul, which is, will the architect be expected to produce a set of drawings for the DTS reference building? Um, I, I think uh, this will depend to a large extent on, on uh, a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and the, the level of detail in the drawings will also vary depending on obviously on the, st on the stage of the project as well. Um, I think if you st start talking about a whole set of drawings involving uh, at, at um, uh, the end of the detailed design stage or, or, or final design, I think a full set of drawings probably wouldn't be appropriate. Um, the, normally the fire safety verification method and most performance solutions should be undertaken uh, probably at schematic design stage leading into design development, and then the, the details are carried on. So theoretically, you, you would need a building that's got a clearly defined layout and the, the details that are pertinent to the actual study and, and the analysis that's been undertaken, whether they're fully developed uh, drawings for uh, all purposes or uh, is, is a matter of debate, but... Uh, uh, probably the easiest way, uh, depending on the similarity of the buildings, is to use your existing buildings and then just change them as to what you would do for DTS compliance in accordance with what was agreed at, at the performance design brief stage. Thank you, Paul. Uh, look, the next question I will answer, um, which is if proposing to use the fire safety verification method and other methods, could this be incorporated into the fire and engineering brief rather than two separate reports? Um, so this is a terminology-based question. Um, traditionally, in the fire engineering world, the fire engineering brief has been the documentation terminology used. Um, the ABCB has started to introduce the term performance-based design brief. The intention that are is these are two similar processes. The key differentiator being that the performance-based design brief is used commonly across the entirety of the code. Um, the fire engineering brief is the same process, however, is specific to the fire engineering brief. Um, they can be used and will likely be used interchangeably as the FEB or fire engineering brief term is currently used throughout the fire engineering um, area. Um, but either or is basically the same process. Uh, our next question is, I will push to Paul. Uh, is the reference building considered to be a hypothetical building? Um, I'm, I'm not too sure um, uh, what, what he's meant by uh, a hypothetical building. Um, I, I, I think, uh, uh, again, it sort of uh, ties in with the previous answer I gave, that, that it, it, it's a building that, that should be able to be built. It's a building that, that, that is very similar to the proposed performance solution. Uh, but uh, 
has the variations from the deemed to satisfy provision changed so that they do comply with the DTS provisions. So uh, it should be uh, potentially a real, real build, building, but it's not going to be built necessarily unless when you go through the process, you decide that the deemed to satisfy building is easier to build than your performance solution. Wouldn't necessarily be a first time. Um, so basically, yeah, uh, it, it has to be real enough that it can be built but obviously the intention is that it's not going to be built. I don't know whether that's helping. Thanks, Paul. Um, look, I'll, I'll pass this next question to Mark, uh, specifically in reference to AFAC. Um, do AFAC agencies expect to have an increase in workload of reviewing fire safety design as a result of the commencement of the fire safety verification method? Uh, and then following on from that, do they expect any additional work as, um, as part of their submissions towards them as a result of this process? Thanks for the question. Um, yes, <laughs> short answer, yes. Uh, we expect more buildings to come our way. Um, we expect, I mean, it, it, is, it is also dependent on the take up of industry. Um, the FSVM, as I, as I mentioned, uh, is going to impose a little more additional work, uh, a bit more rigour around um, proposals, and therefore um, I'm not sure whether the industry may shy away from that. However, um, certainly between the FSVM uh, and some other developments in the built environment space, the regulatory space, we're expecting more work to come fire services way. Um, some of that is being driven by the BMF and the implementation of Shergold Weir, some of it is certainly being driven by community and government expectations. Um, in preparation for that, uh, my technical group uh, put up a briefing to the AFAC Council, um, itemising some of the, the expansion of our role that, that could be coming our way um, and flagging the fact that we need to be resourced properly to be able to meet that demand. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'll pass this question, next question on to uh, Paul, which is, should architects or building designers be involved in the performance-based design brief? Um, absolutely, you couldn't have a performance-based design brief without your lead designer involved. They have to give uh, input into uh, uh, all, all aspects of the design. Um, and uh, essentially they're responsible for coordinating the outcomes as well. So um, they are an integral part and, and should always be involved in a, a performance-based design brief. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, and look, I'll leave this next one on to yourself as well, which is, will the fire safety verification method apply to all building classes? Um, well, the version uh, the, the, the it's in or, or the part of the NCC it's in relates to class 229 buildings and as, as such it can be applied to those class 2 to 9. The decision whether it applies to class 1 buildings uh, and 10 buildings depends on whether it's ever inserted into, into that document. That, that's my uh, perspective on it. Um, so it's really a matter of, of, of the scope. There's no reason why the procedures couldn't be applied to a class one building, but whether it's practical uh, is, is perhaps another matter. Uh, thank you for that, Paul. Um, and a, a next question, which is, will the fire safety verification method apply to new or renovating buildings? Um, I might get Mark's um, response to this one first. Oh, okay. Yeah, my understanding is that if it involves a performance solution, it will come to us. So if um, the renovation of the building, a major renovation, um, uh, has significant performance solutions involved in the design, then uh, the FSVM could be used in that pathway. Uh, thanks, Mark. And look, I will just extend on that and say the other um, regulatory response that is also is the fire safety verification method can be applied to any building which which is considered to be new building work, um, and that is defined by your uh, state and territory 
regulations um, and does vary across all states and territories in Australia. Um, so you'd have to go to reference of your appropriate authority, um, be that your building certifier or surveyor or your local council, um, and they will let you know whether what is being done is considered new or renovating building, uh, new works or renovating, and whether something like the fire safety verification method is an appropriate method for that piece of work. And look, thank you. That is um, the last question that we've got coming in currently. Um, we appreciate everyone logging in. Um, and I think that will bring an end to today's webinar. Um, thank you.